Yo, 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 yo. What's good with it? It's the homie Mac. Music, art, culture, knowledge. Reporting live from the Dogon. Each one teach one, each one teach one, each one teach one. Peace and love to all. Um, this channel is growing uh, exponentially. I know that's my word, exponentially. Um, appreciate all the love, all the shares, all the comments and subscribers. Appreciate everything. Um, hit that like button. You know, hit that like button. I need the algorithm to feel me. I need you to subscribe, subscribe, and uh, hit that notification bell. So anytime I upload something new, it'll you'll get it notified. But yeah, let's get to it. This is a session of Mac Minutes. Um, this se this session of Mac Minutes will be entitled. Crip walking in a free market economy. What the hell does that mean, Mac? I'm glad you asked. Okay, so first off, um, what exactly is a free market? A free market, um, I want to give you all the, the scholarly definition. I have my own definition, uh, but it, I, don't, I want to be more concise. So I'm going to give you guys the Merriam-Webster definition definition of uh, scholarly let me find it I mean definition of uh, free market bear with me a second uh, 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 uh. okay free market a free market is an economic system in which prices are determined by unrestricted competition between privately owned businesses okay give me an example okay I'll give you an example <laughs> um, Burger King, McDonald's, Wendy's, um, Checkers. What do these places all have in common? They're, they're restaurants. The service that they provide is food. Uh, they're in competition. So uh, ideally, in theory, within the, within the capitalist infrastructure, within a free market, um, you're allowed to set your prices. And it's unregulated by the government. Now, it, it's regulated to the extent of, you know, the quality of the food, um, you got. They have to go through um, what is it? A health evaluations. Make sure that the, the, the things are sanitary, and that the meat or whatever that they're serving is not um, going to spread pathogens. You know, fundamental things like that. But as far as uh, being able to set up their business and set up shop in different places, uh, it's kind of uh, laissez-faire capitalism. Like the government kind of isn't hands-on about that. You know, do your thing. Do your thing. As long as you ain't hurt nobody. We will regulate you to make sure you're not hurting nobody. Um, but that's free market capitalism. Anybody can set up a, a business and compete in the market. In theory, <laughs> and, and when I say in theory, basically, uh, I can to be able to compete is to be viable. You can start up a business, but you're com you may be competing against old money. So it may take you a time. It may take some time for you to actually compete <clears throat> in the free market. But I, I think in theory. A uh, free market is a beautiful thing. Like you, you have the, uh, you know, you have the, you have at least the chance to uh, establish establish yourself and become self determined. In some countries, uh, you don't have that freedom. You you pretty much are uh, the the it's big government, um, private enterprises not uh, doesn't exist. <laughs> like the government regulates everything. You don't have uh, the right to self determination. Um, Economically, at least. Uh, let's get to another thing. Um, what is capitalism? Capitalism is a social and economic system where both the means of production and any associated trade are privately owned. Okay, so what did I just say? I said how, uh, you know, in some nation states, in some countries, you, you don't have the, uh, the agency to just start your own business or to be the owner of the means of production. Um, because they, the, everything is regulated by the government. Um, I guess, uh, you could say that's communism, socialism. So that's why you got a lot of Republicans. And to an extent, I respect it. You got a lot of Republicans that are just like, man, I ain't cool with socialism or communism. Because you're, you, you don't have as much agency to do what you do. Uh, or, or would desire to do. The only thing I don't like about capitalism is I feel as though it does, um, become a breeding ground for greed. And injustice to the sense of where um, government essentially takes the back seat to big business. It's like Noam Chomsky said, uh, government is a shadow cast by big business. So it gets to a point where big 
the, the country, our, our country itself becomes an, a corporation. And it comes to a point where the government um, is more, more or less about protecting the, wealth, the, 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 the wealthy or ruling class, the bourgeoisie, um, because they're, they're the money machine. So you're going to do things to function at the behest of said money machine because you want that money to keep rolling. And the, the thing that sucks about that is the, the proletariat, the lumpen proletariat, the disenfranchised poor people, a lot of times they suffer because of that. And again, let's, uh, one of the things I want to talk about is a criminogenic society. What is a criminogenic society? A criminogenic society is a society that uh, thrives off of crime, thrives off of criminality. Um, uh, it, it 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 is a breeding ground for crime because crime is big business. Uh, and you may be thinking, well, in theory, nobody would want crime, and in theory, nobody would want crime. But the it's kind of a it's kind of a dystopian cycle because it's like, no, you don't want crime. We don't want crime. But the prison industrial complex, the school to prison pipeline has created a demand for crime because it's a billion dollar industry. Matter of fact, you had a uh, a prison warden in Wisconsin who actually sued um, the state of Wisconsin uh, for not having enough prisoners. Like WTF. Um, <laughs> but back to the, the um, <coughs> a, a criminogenic, it, it, uh, it creates, again, it, it, it uh, facilitates crime. Because crime is big business, and um, in a lot of ways, when you're dealing with systemic oppression, uh, specifically institutional um, institutional racism, where people are cut off from certain things based off of their race, so they have to find a roundabout way to get things. Or if you become or illegal roundabout way, meaning illegal, or um, if you become disenfranchised, either you're poor or, for example, you uh, you are an ex-con and you try to get a job. You can be literally um, legally discriminated against. You can be denied housing. You can be denied a job. I know in some states they just made it where you can vote, I think. But you are literally reduced to a second-class citizen. And that's why recidivism is so high. Recidiv recidivism meaning uh, return returning back into the prison system or the jail system. Uh, because you, you can't find a viable legal means to support a lifestyle that you want. So what happens is you engage in more criminal behavior, and it's a cycle. You end up going back. Um, yeah, and it's, it, this leads me to the uh, a quote from Aristotle. Aristotle said that poverty, po what did he say? He said, uh, poverty and crime are the parents of revolution. You know, and uh, one of the things that Marx used to always say um, was, was essentially that uh, the, the ruling class or the bourgeoisie Again, will function at the behest of big business um, by essentially creating the atmosphere again for big business to flow, big business to thrive, and at and at the same token, uh, laws are created to protect the ruling class, specifically property. Wealth is gained a lot of times through property. Um, you have the real estate to set up a business. Um, that that real estate will be protected by the law. And a lot, of, and by default, I don't even want to say by default. I think it's, it's definitely intentional. Um, the ruling class is protected under that because the, their property, the, the means by which they make money, is protected. You know, and it's almost like we put that over the value of human life. Um, but I guess to play devil's advocate, you can say, well, shoot, if they're if they're making the money, you know, their, their means of making money should be protected. And I get that, but you know. I just think human life should take precedent over real estate, over property, over materialism. Um, but you know, Mac, you said this is Crips in a free market economy. Crip, Crip walking in a free market economy. Make it make sense, bro. Uh, how did you come to this title for this session of Mac Minutes? Okay, so we just talked about a uh, criminogenic society. We talked about a free market economy. We talked about capitalism. Okay, how did the Crips come into play with this? Okay, I want to use uh, an example of a... Uh, 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 a notorious um, set in L.A., Crip set in L.A. called H.R.A. Gangsta Crips. Uh, you know, they're centered around 83rd Street on the west side of South Central. Um, all this is public information. Um, you know, <laughs> you can go on YouTube and see videos where they repping their hood. So this ain't no 
I'm over here dry snitching. Uh, this is the hood where uh, Monster Cody came from, um, notably. Uh, there's a man um, named Roy Summers. A lot, of, a lot of times people know about Freeway Rick. Um, but there were a lot of kings. There were there were a lot of uh, kingpins in L.A. The first dropping point for the cocaine came from South America, hit the West Coast, specifically Oakland. They called it Copeland, L.A. Um, you had what in Oakland? You had um, Felix Mitchell and the Six Nine Mob. Yeah, and then you had uh, Freeway again. Freeway Rig. You had uh, Roy Summers uh, with the A Trey Gangsters. He basically got a lot of Crips together. They, uh, he functioned as a CEO. This man was 23 years old, but he had the mind of a corporate CEO. This man probably could have went to Harvard uh, School of Business, could have went to Penn School of Business, um, Stanford School of Business, whatever. He, he probably could have went there. But, you know, um, a lot of times the, the, the people, his demographic, the lot that they've been serving in life, um, it's not set up for them to fail. I mean, it's not set up for them to succeed. It's set up to profit off their failure. Again, prison industry, billion dollar industry. Um, but let's let me get let's get to it. So Roy Summers did his thing, he linked up with his homies, they set up a bi coastal operation. They were making millions of dollars millions of dollars a week. This is uh they, they set up shop in Seattle, set up shop uh, all throughout LA, set up shop in the Bay, uh, Kansas City, and they even went as far east as Maryland, DMV, DMV area. Uh fair but not not D C proper. But like Fairfax, Hyattsville, um, Fairfax, Virginia, Hyattsville, Maryland, uh, the DMV area. Now they said Roy was uh, supplying dudes in DC, but uh, he said he noticed how like guys were getting murdered, suppliers were getting murdered in the sense of once you supply them, they feel like once you supply them again, they need a discount. If they didn't get a discount, they turn your TV off. Um, and they said, I remember uh, watching an interview with a federal agent, and he said Roy didn't even want to deal with them because he said, all these dudes in D.C., they shooters. You know, D.C., um, this isn't necessarily unique to D.C. Um, in Detroit, New York, uh, cocaine cowboys down in Miami, the, the, the murder game was very rife, and it was very um, in your face, out in the open. <laughs> Irrespective of time, location, it didn't matter. This thing was um, a free-for-all. <laughs> essentially, um, beyond gladiator school. But anyway, uh, this is something I got from the Washington Post. I want to read it. Let me find it. Um, on, Septem on September 27, 1988, an arrest warrant was served on Roy David Summers after he entered a, a vehicle parked outside an apartment complex in Fairfax, Virginia. A search of the vehicle resulted in the seizure of three kilograms of cocaine-based crack and one half kilogram of cocaine. A search of the apartment from which Summers exited revealed three mixing bowls sustaining cocaine residue. A search of Summers' residence in Forestville, Maryland led to the seizure of over 62,686 in cash found under, under and in a mattress and the seizure of approximately seven kilograms of cocaine from a vehicle parked on his premises. Also recovered from the vehicle were a loaded semi-automatic 45 caliber pistol and 46 rounds of ammunition. So this is a uh, hyper capitalism with, with violence, uh, you know, but I guess what uh, I want people to understand uh, the, the same functionality of mainstream legal capitalism, quote unquote, um, is the, the same dynamics come into play in low level capitalism or what Huey P. Newton would call illegitimate capitalism. What's illegitimate capitalism? Illegitimate capitalism is essentially um, the the functionality of capitalism, but it's deemed illegal and it's not recognized in mainstream capitalism legally. Again, um, and and I guess the thing is, again, like I said earlier, uh, when when people are disenfranchised and are systemically cut off from opportunities, um, crime becomes a rational response. To crime becomes a rationalist response in context of a criminogenic society rooted in capitalism. I know I just said a lot. Let me let me <laughs> let me condense it. Let me make it plain. Basically, uh, you know, when you're cut off from things and opportunities, you commit crimes to survive. It becomes an issue of survival. Um, I think the thing about West uh, Western society is we 
we we prop, we we propagate so much materialism, stuff you really don't need. But we, if people are she'll she'll sleep with you if you got this amount of money. She'll date you if you do this. Girl, if you spend this money to get this butt this butt surgery, you'll become beautiful. Like we sell this imagery, and people get caught up in it, and they try to uh, these these things aren't even these these aren't even like compulsory needs. These, you're, you're sold these needs. You're sold these desires. You know, and people get to a point where I think it becomes a self-esteem thing. Where they feel like, you know, I'm lesser than because I don't look a certain way. I'm lesser than because I don't have certain material things. So it's just a cycle. It's Again, it's cyclic in nature. It's a cycle. Um, but yeah, this is not um, an indictment on a gang culture. I'm not, I'm not, worse. I'm not uh, trying to um, glorify it either. I'm just simply saying um, they, the, the, the gangs as we know it, especially in the, uh, in the 80s, they were uh, a, a product of the, of the moving parts of the, of, of the systemic things that were going on. You know, when people feel boxed in, those people, it, it's, it's something called learned helplessness where you just feel like you're not, like whatever you try to do that may be legal, it's just not going to work. So you just adapt you adapt behaviors that are destructive to survive, and I feel like they're just a product of circumstance. The social, the the the, the cultural and social, political, economic milieu of that time, that the milieu of that time created the atmosphere for gang culture, and the the gang culture itself just members mimics hyper capitalism. You know, um, I would say uh, it's it's. It's equally cutthroat, but the violence is just more blatant on average. Not to say that it's not not to say that there isn't mainstream capitalism that isn't violent, because it, it does exist, you know. And there is there is a conundrum there. There is a hypocrisy there, um, as far as mainstream capitalism. But uh.